Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about this with you. A uh, bit unconventional talk topic, I guess, but uh, hopefully you'll come out of this with a lot of useful knowledge um, and learn a lot of stuff that you haven't seen before. Uh, I'm Kevin Burke. Uh, I work at Chip in San Francisco. Uh, we're a company that reverse engineers decades old computer games for fun. Uh, we're actually a logistics uh, startup. We're trying to make it the easiest way to send anything anywhere. Um, so yeah, they've paid for me to come up here. So um, we're hiring too. Uh, if you're interested in a job, um, come talk to me after the talk. Uh, okay, so this project kind of started when I was 12 years old. I uh, played a lot of computer games when I wasn't in school. Uh, and I played Roller Coaster Tycoon in particular. How many people have heard of that game or played it before? Okay, cool. Uh, a lot of you. Wow, that's actually crazy. Uh, all right, so yeah, I played a lot of Roller Coaster Tycoon and I thought, you know, building coasters is fun, but it would be really cool if I could uh, write a computer program to build them for me, right? Because uh, I'm lazy and I thought that would just be the awesomest thing ever. Uh, so yeah, so that was the goal, and then last year I was sitting around on vacation, I thought, well, hey, maybe I'm actually good enough to like do this now, uh, so let me look at it and see if I can actually sort of figure out how to do this. Um, and there are, some, there are some components to the problem just kind of from the outside that made it look promising, right? Uh, there's a grid structure, right? So, so track pieces sort of align with each other on, on fixed points, right? Uh, like right, left, straight, backwards. Uh, there's a fixed number of track pieces, right? It's not like you're making Bezier curves to sort of construct the tracks. Uh, so yeah, so I thought there would be a chance to, to kind of make it work. So I, I kept investigating further. Uh, so what is a cool coaster, right? So this is cool, right? We need to figure out how to kind of encode this in a game. Um, the game gets this kind of nice parameters when you build a coaster, you get, you get ratings about it, right? In particular, you get excitement and nausea and intensity. Um, if you can figure out how those are generated, right, that's, that's a really easy jumping off point and something everyone can kind of agree on as a cool coaster, right? So this was also encouraging in that the game had a kind of in, in built-in rating system that we could sort of piggyback on. Um, so yeah, so next is like, how am I going to interface with this game? Here's someone playing Super Mario. Uh, they had to actually sort of hack into the emulator and, and simulate a bunch of button presses uh, and A and B buttons and that sort of thing. I didn't really want to have to do that. I didn't want to have to simulate mouse clicks on the screen. Um, it just seems kind of tedious and, and, and error prone, right, to, to have to do that. And also slow, right, if you have to like build, bring up a UI and everything. Uh, so I definitely didn't want to do that, right? Here's another example from Duck Hunt. This is an automated Duck Hunt player. Uh, it's actually parsing the, 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 the picture on the screen to figure out where the ducks are and then sort of moving this rifle around. Like I didn't want to have to do that to figure out you know, where, where things were. Um, so I was definitely looking for a way to sort of build it into the game uh, and, and figure out some sort of way to interface with the game. Um, so yeah, so the, the one sort of nice thing is Roller Coaster Tycoon saves tracks separately and gives you an option to save tracks in this TD6 format. Uh, this is me running Wine on my Mac because it's a, it's a PC game. Uh, and it's really funny, you look at like the modified, last modified times on all these files and it's like 1999. Um, so. Really old, really old files. So I say, OK, so what is a TD6 file? Uh, you go and read online, and this guy named James Hughes, kind of he wrote, built this thing, and he did some of the original reverse engineering of the game. Uh, and he published this website. You can see last updated July 7, 2003. Uh, but yeah, it documents the TD6 file format and what exactly uh, this is. Uh, so I say, OK, maybe there's, maybe there's hope of this. Um, so it's, it's funny, right? The maximum size for a track is about 37 kilobytes, which was you know, huge in 1999. So they invented this kind of poor man's like gzip where uh, you read a byte to, to decode a, a, a TD6 track. You read a byte. If it's negative, you read the next byte and then copy it eight times. So, uh, so if you read the byte eight, minus eight, you flip it to eight and then copy that next byte eight times. Um, if it's positive, you read that many bytes in a row, right? So if you have a bunch of unique track pieces, you just read 10 in a row uh, and then just copy them to your output. Um, I wanted to learn Go at the same time. Uh, and Go's interfaces make this really, really easy to deal with. Uh, they have read and write interfaces, which basically uh, deal with byte streams and then report back how many bytes you read and, and whether you had an error reading them. Uh, so this is easy, right? When we read, we just peek at the first byte. Uh, we decode that many bytes and then we return, right? And the Go reader will keep reading and reading from the stream until it's complete. Um, so that interface made it really, really easy. I, I wrote 
nice interfaces for encoding and decoding data from the game, and that was sort of a, a nice starting point, was I could read these existing rides and sort of parse them into, into Go structs. Um, so yeah, so my plan of action there was pretty clear. Let's generate tracks outside of the game using whatever program I want, uh, save to that TD6 track format, load it in the game, uh, and then I can see you know, awesome looking tracks. Um, so yeah, so the next question is how do we represent the track data, right? Uh, I'm lazy uh, in the sense that I didn't want to actually just type in all of the track data myself. Uh, information like how much elevation change is there in this track piece, right? Or if it's a left turn, you know, it goes two forward and two to the left and changes your direction by 90 degrees. I didn't want to enter in all that by hand. Uh, I wanted to find it in the game, um, which turned out to be way more time consuming than just entering it by hand. But um, so yeah, so the tricky part is Roller Coaster Tycoon is, is programmed entirely in x86 uh, with a small amount of C. It was written by one guy uh, who just wrote x86 all by himself uh, back in 99. So yeah, uh, not, not, your, not your typical, let's just go read the source code and, and see what's, what's going on here. Um, so yeah, so, so this was a fun, a fun challenge, figuring this out. If you're not familiar with x86, let's, let's go into it really fast. Uh, so when you write code in a high-level language or even C, your computers can't actually execute the code that you're writing, right? It has to get sort of translated down into CPU instructions so that your computer actually knows how to run the code. Uh, here's just some really, really dumb uh, code that I wrote where I'm assigning variables and then adding to them. Uh, and so what will happen is when this gets compiled or interpreted or whatever, this will get translated into x86 instructions, right? So first we're moving the number three into the register named CX. Uh, then we're adding four to the value that's in CX and storing that also in CX. Uh, that's A, so I kind of annotated this with the right side. Uh, we're moving number six into the register AX. Uh, we're then comparing the two registers, right? And so what this does, this will actually set one bit in a different register called the flags register. Uh, when we call this JLE, that means jump less than or equal to. Um, so jump less than or equal to will check the state of that flag. Uh, if that bit is set, it will do the jump. If it's not set, it won't do the jump, right? Uh, if we say 9, this will jump to label 9 down here, where we say uh, increment the value of B, right? So it just increments by 1 and stores this value in the same register. Um, really, really basic overview. Didn't want to go too far into it, but that's the, that's the basic idea there. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of instructions. Uh, and there's no labels, right? You can label x86. You can add comments and, and useful stuff, but there's, there's none of that in the game. Um, it's kind of like reading like a foreign language, uh, or like deciphering, you know, like random stuff. Uh, it feels kind of like code breaking, right? Like like reading through the stuff and trying to interpret and figure out what's what's going on. Um, so yeah. So how do you find what you were looking for, right? How do you, there's four million lines of code? How do you even start sort of figuring out where to look? Um, so luckily, right around the same time I was looking at this, uh, some people started this project called OpenRCT2 where they wanted to decompile the game engine from x86 into C. That is, take all of the x86 instructions and generate uh, completely compatible C code to replace the x86. Um, there are a lot of advantages to doing this. You can find this. It's on GitHub. Just search for OpenRCT2 and, and, you'll, and you'll see what's there. Um, a lot of advantages to doing this. One is the original game only works with Windows uh, or Wine in, a, in an emulator. Um, but it has like assembly calls that are specific to Windows. So you can't, you can't just port it, right? Um, when it's running in C, you can compile C. Obviously, you can compile for any, any, any target. Uh, and there's a library called SDL2, which you can use to do graphics and sound on any platform. So you can get portability, right? Um, a lot of stuff wasn't ever fixed in the game. It's just sort of shipped and broken. Like the AI for pathfinding is bad. So people are improving it now. Like they can actually understand what the algorithm is and improve it. Uh, you can add cheats, a bunch of different languages. Uh, I wanted to put janitor unionization in the game. Uh, just have like the janitors go on strike and then everything gets really dirty. But I got voted down, so uh, didn't make it. Um, maybe in the future, though. Um, so yeah, so you still need the game assets. Like you still need to buy the, the game to get the artwork and everything. Uh, it's just replacing the engine, uh, turning out the engine um, that they're trying to reverse engineer there. Um, so yeah, so how does this work? So when you load an exe file, the CPU basically has to start executing instructions somewhere, right? Uh, and the exe specifies it start reading at you know 
instruction number seven, right, or whatever. Uh, the guy who started this project, um, basically, instead of going to the original RCT2 entry point, he said, hey, load this uh, open RCT2 entry point instead. They compile all the C code into a DLL and link it against the original EXE. Then you go start at the open RCT2 ex entry point, and you start running all the C code, right? So the C code just sort of starts executing. Um, you distribute that EXE, and now you've got a game that you can play, and, and you're running C code, and you're in the game. Um, the way that they did this without needing to decompile everything first, you can actually call into assembler from C. So they built these sort of library functions. Here's one RCT2 call proc X, for example, that calls an address in the original EXE and sets a bunch of register flags. You can see that sort of going off the screen to the right there. Um, so yeah, so that way you can call into the game. That way the, the game will execute a subroutine. The subroutine will finish. It will return control back to the C code. So that way you can sort of go between C and x86. You don't need to decompile the entire thing first. You can call into C for the parts you haven't decompiled yet, uh, and then go back into, uh, you can go back into C code when, when those sort of x86 functions are done. Um, so yeah, so I had two basic objectives here. One was to find all this track data, uh, and one was to find all, all the game ratings, right? Like how it did ratings. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of hunting around that, that I won't get into too much. I'll, I'll show you this is the successful parts. Um, but yeah, the basic tool for doing this is, is called IDA. Uh, it lets you view x86 and, and sort of slightly nicer and, and annotate it and all kinds of nice stuff. Um, there is a free version you can download for, you know, the, the, the pro version is, I don't know, a billion dollars. But you guys all are here, so you can probably afford it or expense it to your company or something. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so uh, so yeah, IDA. This is the useful tool. Security engineers use this a lot for reverse engineering sort of binaries where they don't know what the data is. Um, same sort of thing uh, for for doing game disassembly. Uh, so yeah, so you get this output that looks like this. It sort of groups instructions into boxes, uh, and then you get these nice arrows, right? If there's a jump or, or execution can sort of branch, you get these arrows between the boxes that sort of show you which way things go, uh, and you can see there's sort of instructions there, and you can click on them and give names to variables and that kind of thing. Um, OK, so when you're trying to find things, the, the open RCT2 team, helpfully, when they decompile something, they label it with the address of the original game code that they, that they decompiled, right? So here is a function called window ride construction paint, and they've got the address on there of the game. So you can see, based on what's been decompiled so far, you can sort of get jumping off points and say, OK, well, here's what this C code looks like in the game, uh, and here's you know, maybe this is the part I'm looking for. Uh, when I was doing all this, none of the stuff that I wanted was decompiled, uh, and I was also interested in contributing to the project, right? So there's a lot of spelunking in the code to see what was going on. Um, there was also this, so the same guy, James Hughes, published this data about tracks. So when tracks show up in the game, they're always in a consistent order, right? Or in the, in the, in the code, they're always in a consistent order. So the first track piece is always just a straight flat piece. The second one is always the beginning of a station, right? Or the end of a station. Um, so that's at least some predictability. You don't know where the stuff is, but it's at least a little bit predictable um, what sort of order it's going to be in, right? So we're looking for something like this, right? There's a base track pointer to some track data that's stored somewhere. We don't know where. Uh, it has a width, a number of bytes that the data is stored in. Right? Each track piece takes up you know, 10 bytes or whatever. Uh, the track piece number, so you know, one for end station, eight for loop-de-loop -loop or whatever. Uh, and then the data offset. So if I want sideways is in byte three, I you know, offset by byte three. Uh, not much to go on, but it lets you start making guesses. right? So you can read through the track data. You can see an address. Uh, and then you can run, write Go code to sort of see what's there, right, and make a guess about it. So Go has really nice uh, interfaces for dealing with this. You can basically open the exe at any point in the exe that you want. You just specify an address. You say read at, uh, and you read it into a byte array, right? Uh, you specify the width. Then uh, you loop over that byte array. Uh, you print out all of the data that's in that array. Uh, you print out the, the name of the track piece, right, and you see whether the data makes sense. Um, so yeah, so you get these tables that look something like this uh, in the terminal. Here I've got a list of track pieces and a list of data about it, right? You're looking for patterns, right? So if this is the amount of space forward, then I'm expecting a flat piece to you know, have like one or a multiple of one. Uh, if it's you know, an S-band, maybe it goes forward three, so it should be three times 
the number in that column should be three times as big as the, the flat number, right? Uh, and you can sort of look at it and say, okay, this makes sense or this doesn't make sense. Um, and that sort of thing. It's also really easy to spot when you do this. It's easy to spot whether your width is off because all the data will just start looking diagonal. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's neat. It's a neat uh, tool for doing this. So yeah, so it's basically read through the code, make a guess, print out some data, see whether it makes sense, uh, keep reading through the code, keep asking more questions, uh, and make it work. Uh, and Go is really nice sort of formatting tools for doing this, converting between hex and, uh, and regular and, and sort of printing out data uh, in ways that make sense. All right, so I'll skip the two months where I didn't find this. Not two months, but the, the large amount of time where I didn't find this. Uh, so I ended up finding it by sort of looking at the strings in the game. This is a really, really, really useful technique for any sort of code that you don't know, is start with the, start with the sort of things you can see on the screen, right? And then, and then sort of work from there, right? Work backwards from there, and you, you probably get to the point in the code where you want to go. Um, so here there's a string that said too high, right? Uh, so I knew that came up when you try to build too high, right? You can't just build forever high. You know, the game has memory constraints. Um, so I figured somewhere around there, it would be checking the height of the adding, you know, adding to some existing track piece, adding some elevation, and then comparing to see whether it was too high or not. Uh, so the game is all stored in hex. So open up a Python interpreter, take string 878, which is that too high string, turn it into hex. Uh, search for it in the game, just for any, any mention of that, that string in the game. Um, and we get three promising ones, right? There's a bunch of junk in there, and we get three promising ones. Uh, I've just zoomed in on it a little bit, where we move uh, the string 36e, that constant, into a, into a value, right? Uh, so we go spelunking around there. Uh, we find this promising bit of assembly where we're comparing uh, a value to two and then jumping, if it's below somewhere, then we're comparing the value to a high value, jumping above to somewhere else, uh, and then loading in that too high string, right? So you say, okay, well maybe that value is actually the height of the track, right? Let's, let's, let's go back up and, and we'll actually find it. Uh, and that's where I did end up finding the data, just made some guesses around there and, and ended up getting it from there. Uh, okay, so rating data, right? Uh, we wanna find all the excitement data and intensity data and everything. Uh, coasters have really, really complex rating data, as you can expect, a lot of inputs. So let's not start with a roller coaster, let's start with the simplest possible ride in the game, which is a cricket house. So for this one, I just wiped out like every nearby piece of scenery and, and ride data and everything. Built a cricket house like in the middle of nowhere and then checked the, checked the ratings for it. Uh, I was hoping it was like a constant, right? Like they just had some constant, you know, and then maybe multiplied it or varied it by a little bit. Uh, so yeah, so this is what I got. 2.15 for excitement, 0 0.62, 0 0.34, so change these to hex again, search for them in the game, and I found this subroutine, which looks really promising. Uh, and here you can see we have the same values, 215, 62, 34. We have their hex equivalents, we're loading them into three different registers, and then returning, right? So this looks pretty promising. Uh, and then we go up a little bit, right? Because we don't just want Cricket House data, we want on the roller coaster data. Uh, we find this sort of jump table, right, to all these different subroutines. We find the ride data sort of lines up like track data. We know that from the same, same website. Uh, and all these sort of line up, right? So bumper boats are not as complicated as a roller coaster, right? And the sort of code is not as long, right? You can just sort of visually inspect it and see that. Cricket House is really short, right? Roller coasters look really, really complex. Uh, so yeah, so that was where I ended up finding the excitement and intensity data. So that was uh, pretty neat, pretty neat there. Uh, so what is excitement? So this is the, the big reveal. Uh, sorry. Um, so yeah, so, so what actually goes into this, right, in the game? So you start with some initial ride constants based on, you know, whether it's a, a wooden roller coaster or a steel roller coaster. Uh, the length is probably the biggest determinant, both in terms of distance and in terms of time. Um, it's just, just a, a linear multiplier based on that. If it's too short, though, you get a, you get a penalty subtracted. Uh, max speed contributes to excitement. The, more f the faster the ride, the more exciting it is. Uh, the higher the average speed, the more exciting it is. Uh, the more drops, the more exciting. If the drop height is too low, you get a penalty. So the maximum drop height, if it's like too low, it says this is a boring ride. So let's subtract some, uh, some stuff off there. And let's also subtract if it's too intense, right? If you're, if you're barfing the whole time, it's not a very fun ride. Um, Okay, so yeah, so you're wondering, right, like max speed is good, but surely a ride where you're going 100 miles per hour the whole time is not that exciting. Uh, so the way the game sort of deals with this is, 
a lot of times the intensity multiplier will be on the same value, but sort of more intense, right? So here we have for the number of drops, where it increases the excitement, but it increases the intensity more, right? And the excitement's also capped at nine. Uh, so after nine drops, you don't get any more excitement points, um, but intensity keeps, keeps going as, as you keep, keep going through the, through the game. Um, so that's the sort of balance you have to do when you're making these coasters is you have to say, well, this is good for excitement, but it's also going to bump my intensity. Is that, is that trade-off sort of worth it? Um, so yeah, so that was really cool, and that was how I found that stuff. Uh, when you actually start building a fitness function, you realize there's a lot of boring factors that you have to take into consideration, um, things you don't even think about when you're building the game, like the track has to you know, uh, be complete, right? So like... In the game, you just you can't even get to the, like the open the track stage because it's just not complete, right? But there you can um, crash it, right? Uh, there are a ton of of YouTube videos, like really bad YouTube videos. Uh, people think they're just so clever, like making the car just go like all the way like this, uh, and they all have really bad music, um, and they're great. I encourage you to go in, in your break and, and go check those out. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's fun. There's a, it's good. Um, so yeah, so the other part, the track can't collide with itself, right? So it's easy to see you know, when, you're, when you're building this in a, in a UI, but not really easy when you're doing it in a computer. You need to look and say, is this actually going to collide with itself? Where is the other parts of the track, and am I, am I sort of colliding with them? Um, so yeah, so something you need to think about that it's not really obvious when you're, when you're sort of building these in the UI. Uh, the car needs to make it all the way around the track, right? Uh, I don't know why this isn't running. Um, Anyway, it's supposed to, yeah, there it goes. So yeah, so if I build this coaster and I don't put any chains on it, right, the car's just gonna go and then go back. Uh, so yeah, so the car needs to make it all the way around. Um, really, really boring stuff, but like, these are just the prerequisites of, of making an exciting coaster. Um, any questions so far? What's up? Yeah. Yeah, so there's like a mode where you can just launch the car out of the track going like really fast. Uh, just, just try to simplify it as much as possible, so it didn't do that, but yeah. Um, if I had more time, I might actually consider it because you don't, you lose that requirement where, yeah, I mean, you lose the requirement where it has to be a complete loop. Um, so that sort of simplifies it, but I just wanted to focus on the traditional sort of coaster thing, so. Um, all right, let's keep going. Uh, so yeah, so now I need to build an algorithm um, so this is a search problem, right? We have some, some giant space of possible coasters, and we want to find a few really, really good ones, right, um, out of that space, right? We want to, like, move through the space and, and see and try to find a good, a good coaster. Um, so I chose genetic algorithms for this, partly because I was interested in them and have been fascinated since I was a kid and keeping with the... 12-year-old uh, theme. Um, it also works, I, th I thought that sort of the closest analog to this problem was like protein folding, right? Like sort of fitting a track into, into pieces that make sense. Sort of similar to that thing, and, and, and genetic algorithms have had some success with protein folding. You know, there's, I know there's a big fold it thing where people can, you know, use their screensaver and work on it, but, um, but yeah, I thought this was a good, I thought this had a good chance of, of doing it. Um, so that's why I ended up choosing that, um, and we'll walk through sort of how that, how that works and, and, and how that sort of makes sense. Um, yeah, so it's actually a pretty big sort of problem space. Uh, you can do sort of basic estimation. Uh, average track is about 100 pieces. For a given piece, there's about 13 other different pieces you can, you can create based on it. Um, so that makes a lot of possible different tracks and a lot of problem space, right, that we can sort of deal with and need to search through. Uh, it's about a billion times smaller than chess, the problem space, right? So fairly close to chess when you're up there in the, the 110 range of exponents. Um, so yeah, so anything you can do to sort of limit the problem space is, is a good idea, right? So just make the problem as tractable and, and solvable as you can. Then once you, once you have a good solution, you have something that sort of works, add complexity, and you can sort of see and figure out what's going on, right? So let's pick a really, really basic roller coaster, right? As they go, um, once we've solved that, then we can go and do more advanced coasters, right? So no loops, no diagonals, right? You can do diagonal pieces that just make it way more complicated. 
uh, no brakes boosters, right? So this just simplifies all the math that you have to do and all the sort of estimation and calculation you have to do before you get started. Uh, so I picked the like mine train roller coaster if anyone cares. Um, just had like the simplest possible track set that I could find uh, while still being exciting. Um, so yeah, so using a genetic algorithm, how do these things actually work? Uh, basically, there's, there's three steps to it, right? There's three steps to a genetic algorithm. There's selection, mutation, uh, and crossover, right? And, and we'll walk through what each of those mean. Um, the basic idea for a genetic algorithm, you have to express your problem as like a, a, a line, right? Like a set of, a set of strings, or like a, an array of strings. Um, or, or some sort of equivalent of that, right? It has to be like expressible as just some sort of finite, like one-dimensional set, right? Uh, so the canonical example is just generating like a string, right? So let's say we want our goal string was hello world, right? Or hello, um, just to make it really, really, really simple. Um, but we didn't know how to, you know, we had monkeys at a typewriter or something. So we didn't know how to actually generate this just by typing it into the keyboard. Um, so we wanted to sort of find out how to sort of generate this, this string. Um, we start, we just generate a random pool, right? This is another difference from other search algorithms is you start with, with a pool of, of possible search points to sort of start with, uh, and they interact with each other, right? So we generate just a bunch of random strings, right? We, we sit down and uh, peck at the computer until we get some, some random data. Uh, and then once we have these, we evaluate how fit they are, right? Um, we evaluate how close each one is to being the candidate string, right? Um, we want to prioritize ones that are sort of better, more fit. Uh, so there's this function for strings that works really well called the Levenstein distance, where you basically say how many characters would have to change in the string to get the target string, right? So here we'd have to change every single character, right? None of the characters match. So the Levenstein distance is five, right? We have to change every single string, uh, every single character in the string. Uh, here we're, we're slightly closer, right? Here we have the HE matching up in the O. We just need to change the two letters in the middle. So the Levenstein distance is two. Uh, it's much more fit, right? We're much closer to, to the target solution than we are with the other one. Uh, so once we validate, yes, yeah, so the smaller distance from a good solution is, is sort of better fitness, right? Um, it turns out in practice when you make genetic algorithms, the fitness function is the most expensive part, both in terms of figuring out how to express your problem and in terms of like the runtime for computation, right? Um, when you're not doing trivial stuff like the length of a string, like there's normally like a bunch of different inputs, uh, and just computing like what the fitness of something takes a really long time. It's usually sort of the bottleneck uh, in, a, in a genetic algorithm uh, runtime. So yeah, so here's the basic plan. We're going to generate a random pool of strings, evaluate the fitness, let the best ones reproduce, right? So we find all the, the good strings, let them reproduce, uh, and form the next generation. The way that we do that is, uh, we either mutate, we, we change some of the letters, or we cross them over, right? We take half of one string, half of another string, uh, combine them together, and then see whether the new strings are any better than the old ones, right? We repeat this for multiple generations uh, and hope to eventually converge on a solution. Works pretty well uh, for most problems. Um, just need to figure out how to express the fitness function and how to figure out how to express your problem as like a linear set. Um, so yeah, so I use track pieces instead of strings as my kind of inputs. Um, there are some considerations here that you have to think about, right? Like strings, there's no problem putting the number, the letter H right next to the number three, right? You can just do it, right? With track pieces, um, they might be incompatible. So let's say I have a track piece that's going steep up, the next pass track piece is steep down, right? They're not going to, you know, there's going to be a discontinuity there. Uh, in theory, you want the car to sort of go around the track uh, at all times. So that, that makes the algorithms a little bit trickier and adds some extra constraints. Uh, I thought it was worth it versus just generating random possibly invalid tracks uh, and then sort of figuring that out at the end and, and hoping to sort of mutate your way towards a, a valid track. Um, I guess an analog would be like if you generate a Q, like always put a U next to it, right? Because otherwise it's just not going to be a valid word unless you play Scrabble and you know all the, the cheat words. Um, OK, so here's the book. This is by this guy named David Goldberg. This is like if you take a class in college. You're probably going to get this book. It's really good. It's old, but it's really good. Uh, it has a bunch of like reference solutions, uh, a bunch of information. If you say, "Help, my genetic algorithm isn't performing well enough," uh, this is the solution that I. This is what I want to do, right? These are the parameters that I want to set. So you might say, like, uh, "What should my mutation rate be?" Right? What should my crossover rate be? All this stuff. Uh, this has got the basic answers, right? And this will get you 
a lot of the way there until you need to hire you know some really expensive company or something. Um, so yeah, definitely check this out. Uh, really useful book. Um, I'm going to share my link to my slides on the last slide, so I'll show you these. So yeah, so again, just making the problem really, really tractable and solvable. Selection is really, really simple, right? Uh, we give each track a score, and then we basically just give a, a, like a, we create a, like a weighted roulette wheel, right? With all the different tracks, the better your score, the more sort of chances you have. Uh, we draw, you know, spin the wheel. Wherever it lands, we, we pick that track piece and, and it gets through to the next, next generation, right? This is a simple, simple uh, weighted total estimation algorithm. Um, mutation is the same. We loop over every single track piece and every, uh, every member of our pool. Uh, we have a very, very small mutation probability, generate a random number. If that random number is lower than the mutation probability, then we generate a new track piece, right? We just mutate the track. Uh, we replace it with a different piece, right? Uh, we can also do it, we can also insert a new piece. So uh, we can insert, mutate and, and insert, insert a different piece um, or delete a piece, right? Um, crossover, exactly the same, which is two parents. There's variations of this. We have three parents or seven parents or whatever. Uh, you choose a crossover point at random, take the first half of track A, take the second half of track B, put them together. Second half of track A, first half of track B, put them together. Um, yeah, there's more complicated versions of this where you splice like a tiny little bit of the track. Just didn't deal with that, right? Like you choose a point at random, find a place to splice the tracks, and you splice them. Um, so yeah, occasionally let the parents survive because the parents are better. Uh, it depends a lot on, on your fitness function, how, uh, how easy it is to generate like completely wild and valid tracks. Um, but yeah, uh, a lot of useful stuff in the book there. It depends on your problem whether you want to let your parents survive more often or less often. Um, let's see it. How much time do we have? All right, so yeah, so here's the basic idea. Um, I'll show you this really fast. Uh, so I type, I go into my project, I type make experiment. Uh, I get an experiment ID. Um, it takes a little while to run, but yeah, you see, so here's iteration zero. We've got 500 members. Print out some statistics about the best member. Uh, basically, just like how many collisions it has. Uh, how many track pieces we needed to get back to the start of the station, uh, and, and how many times the track speed goes negative, right? Um, this is the basics of the fitness function, so then we can go look at it. Uh, I built this like nice little browser thing. Um, yeah, so here it is. So this is really easy and go to, like they've got a really nice file server server. So I can just click through here, I just type in the experiment ID. Uh, I can go, I can record some data about the experiment stored in meta.json. So as I'm iterating, I can see, oh, this is generated from this commit hash, you know, or I generated this on this day. Uh, basically, I wanted to save every single possible track I generated and, and sort of evaluate the progress as this goes, right? And you can see the sort of more iterations are, are coming in here as I, as I refresh the page. So yeah, so you can go through and click on each of these. Um, yeah, I broke this recently. Uh, this is supposed to be like an in-browser coaster viewer, uh, which I needed to build for two reasons. One is I wanted to be able to share it right, without needing the game. Uh, and a lot of people in the community want to sort of see coasters outside of the game. Um, and I also have the sort of format that you can actually edit, on, unlike this TD6 format. Uh, but I'm not really good at, at 3D code. And I think the camera is like in front of the track or something like that and just facing the wrong direction. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it'd be really nice to do that. So uh, another nice thing in Go, which is super, super easy, to just click download the completed coaster file. I've got like a tiny bit of data that just like writes a uh, TD6 file to basically the output, right? And then I can save this, and I can go save it in the list of tracks uh, and try to load it in the game. Um, this is the part where, where I apologize and, and say um, I've been working really, really, really hard for like the last like month in particular and, and the last year on generating like really cool tracks uh, and I don't have them yet. Um, I'm really sad about that. Like like no one in this room wants more than me to like have like really awesome roller coaster tracks to show you, but I, I don't have them at the moment. Um, you can load the outline. So I can see like I can generate a track and then load the outline. But when I try to build it it says I can't construct this here. Um, so yeah, so let's let's go back to the lessons learned really fast. Like data inconsistencies will kill you, right? Um, so yeah, so this is like one thing I just learned from doing this is just like small inconsistencies in the data sort of make everything just go way, way, way off, right? So like for a while I wasn't loading like left turn data, like left turns were all getting marked as zero uh, sideways. 
that was totally just screwing with all the, you know, is it a complete loop? Is it, you know, let's advance around the track and see where the end point of the track is. Uh, just killed it, right? And then it's just hard to find, right? So you need to really know what you're doing and, and be able to visualize that really well. Uh, right test for your 2D code, right? Like vector math is really, really hard. Just, just test it. Um, and yeah, just, just keep making it more tractable and keep, keep making it really, really easy. But yeah, so the problem where I can't actually build this is because my collision algorithm isn't right something, right? It's not like, it's allowing track to collide. It's not actually colliding. So um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll definitely post on my website and try to get to the top of Hacker News or something. So uh, hopefully you'll see it. Uh, when I actually figure this out, yeah, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm on a mission. I'm, I'm going to get it done. Um, thanks to my friend Kyle, who's on my, with me on vacation and, and helped a lot and sort of designing all this and visualizing all this and, and providing a lot of motivation uh, for getting the track going. Um, that's about it. Uh, that's a link to the project right here, GitHub Kevin Burke RCT. This is my website. This is my email. If you want to get in touch, please get in touch via email or Twitter. Uh, and then here's where the slides are. Um, thanks very much. I think we've got about three minutes or so for questions. Um, yeah. Um, with the original code, was it just uh, disassembled from the object code, or was it actually released as assembler with no comments? So, like, what happened to the original developer? Yeah, the original, he'd released it basically just as x86. There were no comments or anything, right? So, the, p the team that's disassembling it into C is using that no comment version and, and just reassembling it, basically. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fun. You can go through the issues and see just how hard it is to, to build something that's consistent and good and, and reassemble. And there's just no labels, right? And you don't really know um, what you're doing. Like you make one mistake and everything just goes way off. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, how do you deal with sort of splicing two tracks if they're not compatible, then, you, then you're kind of toast. Um, yeah, I just basically just sort of checked if the two pieces are compatible. Just choose a random point, right? Check if the track pieces are compatible. If they're not, advance one, you know, check whether they're compatible again. Advance one, check whether they're compatible until you just find a point, right? Um, not great, but hopefully it will be OK because you've got enough other like, random sort of mutation going on in there. Um, but yeah, that's the basic idea, just the, just the dumbest thing that, that works, you know? Um, but yeah, like it, it, it's going pretty good, right? You can see, like, I can see the score start initially low, and it gets better, and like the median score in the pool gets better as, as you sort of go. Um, so yeah, so I'm excited that you know things are going in the right direction. Just need to keep working on the project and keep sort of keep sort of going through it. Any other questions? Um, you can buy the game for like ten bucks. If you get bored tonight in your hotel room or whatever. Um, thanks very much. Thanks for coming. I hope you learned something. <laughs>